Hello and a very good afternoon. Let me welcome you all to the session on India UAE Comprehensive Economic Cooperation and Partnership Agreement, Opportunities and Areas of Cooperation. On February 18 this year, India and the UAE signed the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, the SEPA, which is set to reduce tariffs for 80% of goods and give zero duty access to 90% of India's exports to the UAE. The agreement is also expected to boost the annual bilateral trade between the two nations to uh, around 100 billion US dollars uh, within, the within five years of its adoption, up from uh, the, the, the present levels of 60 billion US dollars. Further, it is envisaged to boost the country's exports in a large number of uh, labor intensive sectors, including gems and jewelry, textiles, leather, footwear, sports goods, engineering goods uh, and pharmaceuticals. Uh, some have also put this forward that, that uh, the services trade have, will also grow as a result of this FTA. Apart from this, it is further expected that the FTA will increase the remittance from the Middle East, which is already in fact uh, to the tune of 82% of the Indian total Indian remittances. Uh, as such, if one notes that there is a sudden renewed interest uh, from the Indian side in signing trade agreements after a break of uh, almost a decade. Uh, and and, and, and uh, when one looks at India's intent to sign FTAs or the RTAs, regional trade agreements, with various nations or being a part of uh, a trade and investment bloc, one finds that uh, there have been its supporters as well as the detractors. And on recent count, India's withdrawal from the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, that is the RCEP, has met with a host of criticisms. There were voices within and outside India that felt that India has simply missed out the bus by not being a member of the mega trade deal. While many others uh, opposed essentially India's uh, entry into the RCEP from within the nation from the standpoint that the economy is not really prepared adequately to face the sectoral competitions to be posed by manufacturing uh, in ASEAN or, or suppose the agricultural sector uh, from Australia. However, one of the reasons, uh, of course, uh, seems to be uh, for India's exit was definitely geopolitical or geostrategic, and that is the presence of China in, in, in the RCEP bloc. Now, post India's withdrawal from the trade bloc, India has now been contemplating to sign, uh, sign, to sign a series of bilateral trade agreements, mostly with, uh, with, with friendly nations. India, UAE, SIPA is already signed. Trade agreements with Australia, UK, and Canada are in advanced stages. The arguments in favor and against these FTAs also prevail in public forum, uh, with the debates around them slated to escalate as dates of signing come closer. Now, there are the two ways, in fact, to approach this problem from a policy perspective. This is also because of the fact that uh, FTA signing is a two level game with its implications at the international and the domestic levels. At the international level, definitely you have to deal with uh, the negotiating nation, uh, at, uh, the issues with the, at the geostrategic sphere. At the domestic level, you have to deal with a host of contending domestic constituencies. There is also a need for understanding these FTAs as also the India UAE FTA from a geoeconomic, geopolitical, or a geostrategic perspective. Many perceived India's withdrawal from the RCEP as protectionist or conservative. However, many were apprehensive about RCEP due to the Chinese presence in the bloc. Therefore, does India's getting into FTAs with friendly nations or India UAE FTA simply uh, put across this message that it is shedding off the conservative protectionist image? On the other hand, we have been looking at FTAs from a benefits perspective. It's important to understand the costs also associated with them, whether from an economic perspective or from other perspectives. And to understand the India UAE FTA from a geostrategic, political, and economic perspective, what are the rationales that, have, that, that get into them uh, in terms of uh, the after effects? We have a panel today, an extremely distinguished panel, consisting of Ambassador Nabdeep Suri, who is a distinguished fellow at the Observer Research Foundation, Professor Aparna Soni, Professor of Economics at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, Dr. Meena Singh Roy, Distinguished Fellow at the Middle East Institute, and Mr. Suresh Kumar, Chairman, Indian Business and Professional Council, Dubai. Uh, as I hand over the mantle to the panelists, uh, I request each of the panelists to confine their first set of uh, interventions within 
eight to 10 minutes so that we can go for a second round. I will of course indicate the time. So let me first uh, come to Ambassador Suri. Uh, Ambassador Suri, it will indeed be a pleasure to have you as the opening batsman here, given your deep involvement with the Middle East, especially the UAE. Now we can come to economics of it. What, what about the critical geostrategic gains? What about the bilateral relations? How is the game going to be played now, given the uh, forces, the way the forces are unfolding in the geostrategic sphere? Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Ghosh. And uh, you're absolutely right that in the presence of three distinguished economists, uh, I will steer clear of the uh, technical issues of, uh, uh, of an FTA or a SIPA, uh, such as trade creation and trade diversion and uh, the costs and the benefits in, 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 in hardcore economic terms. Uh, and, and maybe take the uh, political perspective that behoves a former ambassador to UAE who was uh, actively involved in the initial stages of this uh, particular, uh, particular SIPA. Um, let me say that it flows from the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Agreement that was signed in January 2017 uh, when Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the de facto ruler of uh, UAE, uh, was the chief guest at our Republic Day. Uh, but since I'm aware also that, uh, you know, the uh, audiences who will follow this program on, uh, on YouTube and other channels may not be as familiar perhaps with uh, uh, some of the aspects of the India-UA relationship, let me just put out three or four that to me are particularly salient. Uh, it is counterintuitive that UAE is our third largest trading partner after US and China, uh, larger than France or Germany or Great Britain or uh, Japan. Uh, it is counterintuitive that uh, UAE is already the second largest destination of our exports next only to the United States. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realize that UAE is our largest concentration of Indian nationals outside India at about 3.4 million. There are probably about 4 million persons of Indian origin in the United States, which is a larger number, but many of them are US nationals. Uh, uh, in the case of UAE, a vast majority of this 3.4 million are very much still Indian nationals, Indian passport holders, for the simple reason, among others, that UAE doesn't easily give away its uh, citizenship to, uh, to a, a foreigner. Um, when we look at our remittances, uh, if I, the, the figures for 2019, 2020 that I had seen about $85 billion uh, annual remittances according to World Bank data, a quarter of these come from UAE. Uh, that's a $20 billion. And, 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 and so when you look at the 3 million plus families who benefit from the remittances, you can see how large that aspect is. There's another aspect that often gets neglected and that's the investment relationship. Uh, and, and the fact that, you know, um, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority as perhaps the world's second largest sovereign wealth fund um, has taken a very strong, very proactive interest in investing in the Indian economy. They've actually taken this decision that the growth of India is in their enlightened self-interest. Uh, and, and so they became the first anchor investors into our national infrastructure investment fund with a billion dollars uh, and have been putting in more money into renewable energy, ports, potentially airports, logistics, warehousing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the final aspect I think that again uh, is often not sufficiently uh, understood is the size of our energy relationship uh, uh, where uh, UAE has become consistently now over the last couple of years, one of our top three or top four sources of uh, energy. But it's also the only country or the first country in the Middle East where we got a toehold uh, in terms of uh, oil concessions uh, in, in a producing oil field in the lower Zakum uh, uh, basin. So, you know, when you look at the trade, investment, energy, and uh, the Indian community, and Indian community, not just in terms of remittances, Indian community, as some very large businessmen, business houses uh, uh, that are investing in India uh, uh, and the 
professionals in, uh, of Indian origin who really dominate the corporate landscape in, in uh, UAE, uh, in all manner of multinationals and in the financial sector and so on, you can see how that Indian community has the uh, potential to become an extremely uh, strong bridge uh, between our uh, countries. On um, as SIPA itself, I think we should look at it from at least two aspects. One is there's a shorthand to call it an FTA. I really think it's an FTA plus, 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 uh, the way it brings trade and services and investments uh, into the uh, 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 domain. And I think it's important that it should be read alongside the vision document that was released following the uh, virtual summit between Prime Minister Modi and uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, because that vision document articulates several other elements that are not uh, uh, featured in the SIPA, but will have a substantial bearing on the economic relationship as we uh, go forward. And let me just mention two of these, um, or three perhaps. The first is an agreement to establish an India Mart in Dubai. Now, we have for years looked at the uh, advantages that accrued to China when it started the uh, Dragon Mart uh, in uh, Dubai, because it gave Chinese uh, exporters a retail space backed by warehousing and logistics. And so what it meant was that an importer from Kenya or Ethiopia or Uzbekistan or uh, anywhere else in the region didn't have to go to a particular Chinese city to source the products. He or she could come to Dubai, take advantage of the exceptional connectivity that Emirates Airlines provides directly to so many capitals, hop on a direct flight to Dubai, go to the Dragon Mart, choose the product, touch and feel it, and place an order and have it shipped. Now, India Mart could potentially offer us this, and it will be a real boon for our MSME sector, which often produces very good quality products, but doesn't have quite the wherewithal to be exposed to the international market. So I think the India Mart uh, is, a, is an exceptionally important initiative to help Indian products get displayed and showcased in, 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 in Dubai for export to the broader uh, region. The other one, which is at a fairly advanced stage of discussion, is reciprocal special economic zones. One in India, one in UAE, for our respective companies to come and really uh, experience a comfort level uh, that they may not, uh, uh, if, if they are alone in a particular part of our very large and diverse country. Uh, and, and I think if this particular thing takes off, you will see a spin-off uh, that uh, will uh, uh, not only bring investments, but also boost exports. Um, the other thing that I see is, uh, which I think is really important, is a, the political will that the government has demonstrated to not only negotiate a, an 880 page long agreement in three months, uh, which means that the government can move when it wishes to move. Uh, but <clears throat> the fact that this is our first FTA in a decade, and, and we wanted that the first one should be signed with UAE. Uh, and, and, and so that shows the political intent from the leadership of the two countries to maintain this premium or prime position of the relationship and do the signaling. Uh, I, I happened to be in uh, Dubai for the expo the day that the agreement was signed. Um, and what I found surprising was half a dozen Emirati ministers writing op-eds about the importance of the SIPA that were published in every leading English and Arabic language daily, and even uh, one in the Hindustan Times and one perhaps in the Economic Times. Uh, a very deliberate effort to convey the importance of it to the business communities of the, of the two uh, countries. Um, two final points. One is that I think we shouldn't underestimate the, uh, the psychological message. Uh, that this sense. 
I think Dr. Ghosh mentioned it in his opening comments. It is a reality that a number of Emirati blue chip companies, whether it was Etihad Airlines in its failed experience with Jet Airways, whether it was Etisalat in its experience with uh, Shahid Balwa during the 2G uh, scam, uh, or it was Imar with MGF, they have had an unpleasant experience in India. They've actually lost money in India. Uh, and India has, and, and those, their experiences kind of reinforced perceptions that India is not the easiest place to do business in. I think the speed with which we've finalized the SIPA, the manner in which we announced it, the fact that we bring in these plus plus categories of the India Mart and the SCZs and so on, sends that positive message that India is once again open for business. And, and that should be a reassuring message to, to, the, uh, to the investors community. And finally, I think um, this SIPA potentially sets the tone for the broader India GCC FTA, which has moved in fits and starts over the last decade. Uh, I'm aware that it's not the easiest one to negotiate because among other things, there are serious trade disputes emerging between Saudi Arabia and UAE as the two largest economies in the GCC uh, region. Uh, but despite that, there is a renewed interest in finalizing this. And I think the fact that we now have a template with UAE might just make it easier for us to uh, sign an agreement with a GCC with all the attendant uh, benefits, et cetera. Uh, I'd love to hear from the other panelists uh, what they think of safeguards, what they think about the possibility of abuse or misuse of an FTA, our previous experience with the ASEAN countries uh, uh, didn't uh, uh, particularly do uh, us uh, a, a lot of good. Have we been smart enough in terms of putting a 40% value addition norm in the rules of origin? Um, have we been smart enough in saying that we will now look at FTAs with economies with which we have a strong degree of complementarity rather than those that we are competing in the same space with as happened with South Korea or, 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 or some other countries? Uh, so, so those are my uh, few initial thoughts uh, and uh, uh, look forward to hearing from the uh, other experts. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Suri. I presume that's... Uh... Uh, sets the tone for the entire deliberation of this particular session. A uh, host, host of things have already been flagged and you raised quite a few questions. I'd just like to add to what you raised. Uh, definitely in the context of the costs that you mentioned in here, finally. And that will be uh, one of the questions to be posed to Professor Aparna Soni. Uh, apart from uh, what Ambassador Suri raised, one of the concerns that I have is uh, especially with uh, respect to our experience uh, with, the, with, with, with the FTAs, with most of the Asian nations, is that what is the impact on the commodity or the services value chain within the domestic economy? We know that whenever we went for these types of uh, FTAs, uh, let, let's take up one of the examples, say the edible oil sector. Uh, we know that the large component of the uh, uh, palm oil is getting imported from in, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. And that comprises around 40 to 45% of the total edible oil consumption basket and has invaded to a large extent uh, the, the, the entire edible oil uh, industry, uh, edible oil consumption uh, scenario as far as India is concerned. And this has resulted in fact in lowering of the processing margins and the processing units have closed down, which forced the government uh, because of because of quite a uh, bit of advocacy on part of the Solvent Extractors Association and other, other associations to raise the import duties on edible oil. So this is in fact true for many of the other cases we find this for in the case of electronic goods and other things where essentially the Korean products have invaded the markets. So do you feel that, well, we have complementarities as far as India, UAE are concerned, but there are also others because we are going to follow up with UK, uh, with, uh, with Canada, with Australia. So uh, one is what might be the associated costs and how do we negotiate with the domestic constituencies under such circumstances? Professor Sony, this is an added question below, apart from your own presentation. 
Okay, so thank you. And thank you for setting the tone. There is actually the questions that you've given are very comprehensive. I'm not sure I'll have answers to all of them. Um, but what I will do is uh, very quickly kind of uh, talk a little bit about the, the trade basket itself, because uh, Dr. Chakravarti had uh, indicated that I can talk about the economic scope and the trade between UAE and India. So one of the first observations, which is of course known to all, but uh, even at the risk of repeating, I would say that the pattern of bilateral trade uh, between UAE and India has been quite consistent. The basket has been quite consistent. And over the last 20 years plus, uh, gems and jewelry, petroleum products, apparel, textiles, food, light vessels, iron and steel products have constituted the main exports from India. Whereas uh, crude petroleum, petroleum oils and gases, gold, diamonds, light vessels, metal scrap, primary polymers uh, have been the main imports from the UA. And of course, in more recent years, we saw the increase in trade uh, exports in electronics, um, as well as pharmaceuticals in the last couple of years, especially. So considering the pre-pandemic years, uh, as well as even the last two years, what is surprising is the basket didn't get really changed much. So if one were to think in terms of what the effect of the pandemic was, it wasn't really kind of shaking it up too much. But yes, it was known that apparel exports have reduced and that's something, of course, that the SEPA is expected to increase and so on and so forth. The, what SEPA has promised is essentially uh, invigorating some of these traditional sectors, which already has been observed to be much of it is labor intensive, but also newer areas, especially with pharmaceuticals. And of course, with infrastructure investment coming in. Um, it was coming in earlier, it is expected to increase further. As far as the FDA is concerned, or the comprehensive economic uh, plan that we, agreement that we have, usually with FTAs, and this is a remark uh, referring back to what was indicated uh, just a few minutes ago about trade creation and diversion, one expects to have trade creation and diversion taking place when there are major barriers which are dismantled. If one were to look at uh, the import barriers in terms of the tariffs which were in place in the UAE, so they were never really very high. So even when a few years ago, the Niti Aayog made an observation in its report uh, that gold imports from the UAE versus the uh, jewelry, gold jewelry, which is exported back into the UAE, which is a very large segment, a reasonably large segment after diamonds, uh, there is a 5% uh, tariff, which is our duty, which is imposed by the UAE. And that is going to come down to zero now. Considering India has had a history where we have double digit tariff rates, you know, a 5% duty reducing to 10 doesn't seem to be too much, but yes, it will certainly help. And depending on the price elasticity, we would expect it to increase. Um, what is more promising are the newer areas essentially what uh, Ambassador Suri was referring to in terms of easing up and opening up, having greater investment, opening up of the uh, India mark, which would actually help uh, further presence of the Indian uh, goods and uh, services, and which is also expected to then help in, in what is typically considered to be the gateway to the rest of the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, the other thing which is uh, expected to, in particular, as far as the sector is concerned, is the enhancement in the food and beverages sector. And this is also related to the older India-UAE strategic partnership agreement that existed. Uh, you mentioned it was signed in 2017. I thought it was 2015, be as it may. Uh, essentially, it is the genesis of the deeper agreement that I feel that has emerged now or has been signed now is basically given the, the talks and the partnership and essentially 
what we saw in 2015, 2017, that has been strengthened further. So in terms of some of the newer sectors, like the Indian pharmaceutical segment, uh, I haven't seen it myself, but I have seen the statements which have come out of the Commerce uh, Ministry and the Secretary, essentially that there'll be prior approval uh, for facilities which have already got the certification from the US FDA or the UK uh, MHRA or the Health Canada, essentially saying that this would actually take care of the non-tariff barriers which might have existed. And therefore it was gonna save time from 24 months to about 90 days, which is a huge difference. So essentially kind of reducing the time barrier, which in itself is a very high cost. Now, coming back to the commodity trade, as opposed to investment and movement of people and services, much of the trade that we see uh, that has taken place between the U, uh, UAE and India is intra-industry. Uh, of course, uh, Dr. Ghosh uh, asked directly about the value added. I'll just get into it for a minute. Um, I would like to differentiate between the value chain, global value chain versus intra-industry because it may not exactly be working on what has been imported. What has been imported and been worked on is certainly the value added directly. It's part of the value chain that is evident in the gems and jewelry sector. But there are other sectors where it may be not as evident. For example, we bring in a lot of the metal scrap. We export a lot of uh, iron and steel uh, rolled uh, products, uh, which may not necessarily be coming from the scrap metal, which has been recycled and then generated into the rolled product. So they would be coming out from different facilities altogether. In that sense, there are different segments. But we have a lot of intra-industry trade and the value added becomes very critical as opposed to the gross value of trade. So while we talk about saying that their intent and the aim, and there is expectation that the bilateral trade uh, is going to increase to hundred billion dollars, US dollars in five years, that is by 2026. And this is just the non-oil uh, bilateral trade. It is important to know how much of that would be value added trade, especially since traditionally we have had a lot of re-exports even in one of the core sectors, which is the gems and jewelry sector. And I'll give an example. If one were to track the diamond imports uh, in the HS code 7102, which is diamonds, whether or not worked on, but these are not mounted or set. Uh, we imported about uh, value five to six billion dollars. Um, in 2018, 19, 2019, 20. I'm talking about the pre-pandemic years. And we exported anywhere between 1.5 to $1.3 billion in these same years. Uh, of course, it's also because we export the gems and jewelry and diamonds to other countries. But if one were to think in terms of some of these gems, whether they have been value added or were they actually re-exports, re-exports where no value might have been added. It becomes critical to actually make the differentiation and know because if there is no value addition, that means the employment and the income generation potential of that increased bilateral trade may be very, very minimal, negligible. But of course, as I said, only part of that trade would be re-exports, not all of it. Similarly, in some of the more, um, uh, or some of the new segments like the electronic sector, uh, there is a high import content, for example, in smartphones. And here is where the rules of origin clause would actually kick in. And I am not sure whether 40% value added is the correct number, but it certainly seems a reasonably high number, which would ensure that re-exports uh, are not going to get preferential treatment. Uh, similarly, exports which are from third countries. Uh, so if you're concerned about uh, cheaper Chinese products, which might be coming through UAE, that would be taken care of. It would not enter. So 
that 40% value added aspect certainly seems to be uh, a good uh, number to be in there. But as I said, what that exact number should be, whether 40, 30, 50, uh, I'm really not sure. And I haven't gotten into that. Um, Lastly, can you just, yeah, please, yeah, okay, fine, sure. Just last, last. Yeah, sure. So, because you had also said that energy uh, is important, in fact, half our uh, import bill with the UAE is, is based on crude oil and petroleum oils and gases. On the environmental front, India and UAE have indicated that they will have a joint task force on hydrogen to generate green hydrogen, and UAE is going to be actually hosting the UN framework convention, UNFCC's uh, COP28 next year. So on the environmental front, that's actually a good news because India also wants to kind of ensure that it is on a green and a cleaner energy path. In here, the last thing that I want to say is in terms of the commodity trade, there is one flag that one needs to actually be a little uh, concerned about, that whether environmental challenges and other aspects, like in the waste metal processing sector, which is known to be a very pollution intensive sector, whether those have also been incorporated and the cost has been internalized. And that would be important, especially since India imports substantive amount of waste metal scrap and exports to the UAE, UAE the iron and steel as well as aluminum uh, products. So I will stop here. I know I'm yet to touch upon uh, some of the other questions that I that you had posed. I think I think I will come back to you in the second round. But I presume yes. this, this, especially the last two points that you mentioned, and uh, internalizing the cost of the West metals uh, th that India is importing. I I don't really think that that is happening. And uh, given the myopic nature of human instincts. We definitely can't see, but this is a very, very crucial point that has been raised in the context of the externalities. And I know that uh, given your work on trade and environment, you, are, you, uh, I mean, you instinctively raised this question and I'm extremely happy and elated that you did that. So, uh, I mean, a host of ground has been covered in fact, quite a 360 degree, though in fact, in the confines of 10 minutes, not much could be done, but for the definitely pharmaceutical segments that that is going to be a crucial element in here. With this being uh, this ground already being covered, Professor Meena Singh Roy, given the deliberations by Ambassador Suri and Professor Aparna Soni, in which, which were largely complementary to each other, what do you think? How do you feel that the geo geostrategic forces are going to unfold now, and what might be the bilateral geopolitical implications uh, as far as this FTA is concerned. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Bosch. It's indeed a pleasure to be part of such, uh, you know, uh, imminent uh, speakers in the panel. And uh, I'm no economist, uh, but uh, of course, uh, the, the defense security and the uh, geopolitical dimensions have been uh, the areas that I've been looking at. But every uh, aspect of the bilateral relationship, you know, uh, I would say the, the, uh, the strength, uh, the, the bottom line actually uh, is the economic diplomacy. And that is what uh, is the important aspect of it. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are, you know, when we talk about uh, geoeconomics uh, and we look at the present level of cooperation between the two nations, I have termed it as the golden period of uh, cooperation between India and UAE. And uh, I would say this particular uh, agreement, uh, you know, uh, that we've signed, uh, I would say it's a, it's a vision document, and I think that is the, uh, the important uh, aspect in any bilateral relationship. We've already identified the Gulf uh, you know, region, which is important for India, given its uh, uh, strategic uh, interest, uh, all uh, dimensions, which Ambassador Suri has already uh, pointed out. Uh, this particular document, actually, you know, the vision, I would say, uh, SIPA is a vision document, a roadmap, 
uh, which has uh, covered, you know, which has covered almost 10 to 11, you know, sectors that we are looking at. So I would try and focus on two points. What I, you know, say is the uh, eco-defense diplomacy, you know, uh, the security dimension of it. Uh, so if we are looking at the geopolitical di dimension of the geostrategic, uh, you know, uh, relationship, uh, you know, we see very new uh, emerging scenarios, uh, whether we are talking about new alignments and the regional power dynamics, uh, whether we are talking about the pandemic and its after effects on the region, uh, whether we are looking at military adventurism, uh, the new arms race, the uh, a very important uh, dimension there I would like to bring in China, the way China has used the developmental diplomacy. And that I think is, is the biggest challenge when uh, we are, as uh, you know, Dr. Koshi pointed out, how the bilateral relationship can, uh, you know, uh, look at the challenges which are geostrategic in nature, geoeconomic in nature. I think this particular uh, initiative uh, of, uh, you know, uh, enhancing and having a roadmap and the vision of cooperation. Uh, the second step I would uh, say is how sustainable, uh, you know, it is and to what extent we are able to deliver what we promise. So that uh, aspect is very, very important when we talk about the bilateral relationship. But uh, the other important, you know, aspect in the geopolitical context, I would say, are two uh, important developments. One is the Abraham Accord, and the second is the New Quad. And uh, when we are talking about the bilateral relationship, we also need to look at the trilateral and the quadrilateral mechanisms, which can actually, you know, uh, uh, do a value addition to our bilateral relationship. And I think three uh, sectors that I would look at, uh, which are extremely important uh, from our point of view, the first I would say science and technology, uh, second I would say innovation, and the third uh, I would say is the startups. So these three, you know, are, and which are covered in the vision documents, you know, if you read uh, there. Uh, and these are going to be the future, you know, uh, areas where we need to put in major effort. And it has to be a demand oriented. Uh, for example, if we are talking about the 3D printing today, now this is where, you know, India can sort of learn more from, from them. There is already, uh, you know, a lot of. Uh, effort which is being put in by the UAE. And here comes your trilateral uh, or quadrilateral cooperation. So that, that is where you know, we need to work on if we are looking at the roadmap. Uh, the other is the, the cyber security, which is also part of it. You know, this is where India's strength lies. And I think you know, these are the areas which we need to uh, look at when we are talking about the, the future of, uh, of the bilateral relationship. And uh, no, you know, I mean, whether it is an economic, you know, roadmap of cooperation between the two countries, but given the size and the scale of security uh, problems, given the size and the scale of uh, cooperation in, in the science and technology or in startups, any, any area that we pick up today, it cannot be purely bilateral, you know. Uh, I think when we talk about the value addition to our relationship, this is where, you know, we bring in the partnership, which is more developmental in its, its uh, you know, essence. And that's where, you know, we need to focus more on. And I think, uh, you know, I have argued, you know, we say defense diplomacy, you know, there again, you know, we are talking about the new reforms within India. We are also talking about how do we, work with our uh, strategic partners in terms of, uh, you know, strengthening and talking about the real development, the sustainable development. And that's where, you know, uh, I think the opportunity lies for uh, the level of cooperation. Ambassador Suri talked about the political will, the role of the leadership, you know, and also, you know, uh, now practically we are seeing there is a forward movement 
on on all all areas that that we are looking at, uh, and there are niche areas there. I think the UAE wants India to work with them, and also you know as I said, you know uh, this is the right time uh, for India, for UAE, for Israel, for US, and I we need to work on various levels. I mean the Ukraine crisis has given us uh, you know enough signals. To see, you know, how complicated and complex uh, is, uh, you know, the situation which is unfolding, and it is going to have a long-term impact globally. And therefore, I think India and UAE can work together. Uh, and, uh, you know, if there is any specific, thing, I'll deal with it. But uh, you said eight to ten minutes in the second round. But for me, I think uh, innovation and youth. Uh, you know, that is where the major role comes in. And uh, I will stop here, but for me, uh, you know, the developmental eco-defense diplomacy is what we need to focus on and not uh, the, the coercive defense uh, diplomacy, you know, is what uh, people have talked about. And I think I'm going to stop here. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, and I can always come back. On, sure, on sure. Topics. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Singh Roy. I presume that uh, this, this, this was definitely helpful, even, even uh, also because of the fact that you brought in the concern of the Western port uh, in the entire frame of things. And uh, I presume that this is going to be a major instrument uh, in the context of uh, the broader geopolitics of the, of, of, of the MENA as such. Uh, Really I'm talking about the new pod in the Middle East, where you yes, the Western, and, yes, and Israel and yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Israel, not, US, Western uh, quad. That's what that's what I that, yeah. that's the term I used here. Yeah. So uh, th that makes it even more interesting. I I come to uh, Mr. Kumar now, especially from the investor's perspective, and the implications that it is going to have for uh, the investors in Dubai, as also. For for India, so it's over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Kocha. Yeah. Let me first uh, reinforce a couple of the uh, points that Ambassador Suri made. Uh, one is the uh, chemistry in the relationship at the leadership level. I think it's worth reiterating that simply because uh, over the last few decades that I've been in the UAE, the momentum in the relationship really picked up since 2015, you know, um, and the comprehensive uh, strategic partnership agreement in 2017. Uh, secondly, the comment that uh, <clears throat> Ambassador Suri made about uh, this being an FTA++ plus uh, plus. <clears throat> It indeed is, you know, the comprehensive uh, by definition uh, would also refer to uh, investments and not just investments, but IPR, you know, intellectual property rights, competition laws, etc. And if there is convergence there, I think it's a win-win because the two uh, IPR regimes or the, <clears throat> the regimes in terms of uh, the competition rules, etc. you know, indeed the whole gamut of uh, those non-trade aspects, uh, if there is, if there are synergies there to be achieved, I think uh, uh, both sides would be very willing to examine because both sides are uh, very keen to conform to global best practices, you know, global uh, rules of the game. Coming back to uh, you know your specific uh, question about. Uh, you know, looking at it from an investor perspective, I think very simplistically, I would uh, uh, divide Dubai and the Northern Emirates in terms of trade in goods and services, um, and uh, Abu Dhabi or the Emirate of Abu Dhabi from an investment perspective. You know, if you want to broaden, of course, there are exceptions. Uh, there are strategic investors from the UAE. There are financial investors from the UAE from the Dubai side as well. <clears throat> so splitting it into strategic and financial, the strategic investors are those such as, say the DP world in Dubai, or for that matter, uh, <clears throat> you have the uh, Mubadlas of the world in Abu Dhabi. Um, 
they have specific agenda, specific sectors in which they would want to operate. And then, you know, that's where they bring their strengths to bear. <clears throat> uh, on the other hand, uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority that Ambassador Suri referred to, is a financial investor and a very savvy financial investor, you know, uh, being the second largest in the world. Uh, you know, they're really investing for the future generations and have very clear criteria and uh, benchmarks in terms of where they would invest and what kind of returns they would expect. And often, uh, at least certainly in 2015, 17, and my various trips to India, I found that that was not very well understood. <clears throat> so all kinds of investment opportunities were taken to Adia and they would very politely not take it forward, sometimes with cups of tea, sometimes even without them. So uh, I think they wanted to make it very clear that they had certain established investment guidelines and if they didn't conform, the fact that there was very strong chemistry at the, at the top did not prevent them from saying no. And they said no more often than they said yes, uh, as, as would befit uh, a sovereign wealth fund that's professionally managed. So I think those nuances are very important to understand. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, even before the NIIF investment was made, the National Infrastructure uh, investment fund investment was made, uh, they had very clear expectations in terms of having governance that they were not investing in a government of India project, but they were investing in a project that was, uh, uh, was not going to be a subsidiary uh, of a government undertaking as it were. <clears throat> they're, they're very clear expectations of finding a good management team relevantly experienced uh, and uh, <clears throat> And then uh, often it is not fully understood, especially the RDR or and the likes of RDR, or for that matter, even the likes of sovereign, sorry, strategic investors like DP World, uh, they have clear investment returns expectations. So, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> something that doesn't conform, they're not a soft loan agency or an aid agency or you know, uh, like the Japan uh, infrastructure uh, agencies uh, of the world. So I think that needs to be fully understood that uh, these are very, sorry. so this matter will have to be dealt with uh, on a professional to professional basis, uh, you know, not necessarily with, between a bureaucrat and, uh, you know, the army of analysts and investment managers that uh, many of them have. <clears throat> Thirdly, uh, coming back to uh, trade, which is the strong point of uh, uh, Dubai uh, specifically, um, you know, for instance, the UAE uh, trade numbers were announced uh, for the you know year to date, uh, just a couple of days back. Uh, it's some 16.4 uh, trillion dirhams, which is a little over 4.5 billion dollars, 4.5 trillion dollars. About a trillion of it is uh, in terms of imports, half of it in terms of re-exports. So uh, there is a significant correlation between imports and re-exports because the absorptive capacity of the UAE economy alone uh, is not going to be sufficient for all the imports that uh, that uh, Dubai particularly, uh, uh, you know, gets into the system. And therefore the uh, re-exports component is uh, clearly strengthened on an ongoing basis by the kind of infrastructure that is needed, the ports, the logistics and the like, with a clear intent to develop re-export markets globally. And that has been successfully pursued over the years by the buyer. Uh, and therefore, even the comment about value added, I think, uh, you know, arguably has come about also because some of the re-exports to the GCC uh, require uh, certification by the UAE authorities uh, and that it's not a, just a pass through. 
uh, from a third country. And therefore, uh, for instance, you know, it was mentioned the, the entry barriers or the access to the pharmaceutical sector has been opened up. Uh, you know, excellent because I think uh, <clears throat> this has been a long-standing demand of many of the pharmace you know, pharmaceutical firms from India. Um, and, the, and it used to be a bottleneck simply because there were strong Western interests as well there in that space that were that were operating that are probably still smarting uh, a little bit at this prospect. Uh, and Mr. Kumar, but sorry to intervene. Can you just summarize in one minute? Sure, sure. Minute. So, so therefore. There's 90 day limit for the firms, yes, pharmaceutical firms is one, but the UAE would expect the pharmaceutical firms to come and set up and uh, do at least some last mile production uh, in the UAE uh, to illustrate. Uh, so I think um, in overall terms, uh, I think the nuances need to be understood very well by exporters and uh, you know, uh, importers in India. Uh, that uh, you operate at the federal level in terms of policy and agreements and the like, but it's really action at the local level, at the respective Emirates level, because all these Emirates are very autonomous, uh, certainly in economic terms. Uh, and uh, while they would respect the agreements that, you know, that have been entered into, they would actually incentivize and go a little further in terms of pushing specific sectoral agenda policy advocacy terms, I think it's a huge opportunity. So I would stop there and uh, take more thank questions. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Kamal. We'll come to, uh, rather, this is not time for the second round. And uh, we have barely eight minutes left. So and four speakers. So can, can in fact, each speaker take up two minutes. I'll, I'll just start with uh, Professor Sonny here. And maybe, in fact, like to end with uh, Ambassador Suri because of reasons that he knows. Well, uh, Professor Sonny, in fact, you want, also wanted to address the concern of the value chain, if I recall correctly. And uh, you raised quite a few very, very important issues. So why don't you put across your summarizing viewpoints along with the value chain aspect that you wanted to address? Yes, thank you. Um, I was uh, going back to the aspect that you had raised about the value chain and whether that would end up having any adverse impact um, which might uh, require uh, then India to bring in um, <clears throat> safeguards. Uh, I do, I mean, of course, this is all gut feeling. Um, as I said that, you know, I noted that the nature of the trade that we have had so far has been more in terms of intra-industry where there is value added, but not necessarily along the value chain per se, except for the gems and jewelry, which is, immediately uh, obvious. And that's perhaps because uh, the UAE itself, as uh, was also now you know, reconfirmed by uh, Mr. Kumar, uh, imports a lot of uh, the commodities for re-exports. So in terms of a value chain aspect to be growing, uh, one would expect that it is along uh, a particular uh, product. So it is like, you know, upstream, downstream, which somehow doesn't seem to be evident either in some of the newer sectors that we are talking about, whether it is uh, pharma or in terms of the electronics. Uh, and that would only happen if these companies are actually producing so that if it is within the domestic economy that it's been produced. So for example, in India, if we end up having much of the components uh, still being imported in electronics, right? And let's say whether it's the smartphones or the solar cells, and then we are just adding value. And if it falls short of 40%, it really doesn't go through that preferential. Similarly, if it is to be coming in and getting preferential treatment within India, it would not really shake up the cart too much because it will not disrupt. But even there from what I saw in the statements, India has reserved the right for bringing in safeguards for all of the sectors which the Indian government has <clears throat> brought in the made in or manufacturing in India, made in India, and where there would be production related incentives. So whatever has been considered to be selected industries or sectors where India wants to develop its own domestic uh, um, strength, 
those sectors would be protected. So right. I am not as, I mean, that's my first gut feeling. So in terms of the question that you asked, right. whether there is such a risk, uh, yeah. And um, I, I think the rest of the things that I wanted to flag, I had uh, made a remark and we're Thank running you. short of time, so. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, Professor Singh Roy, your final comments? I only wanted to sort of uh, lead to two points, uh, and this is in terms of the, uh, the future, you know, and uh, we just, uh, you know, saw the signing of the uh, MOU between the Lulu Group and the Jammu and Kashmir, uh, where for the food processing. That is, you know, we, we talk about the diaspora and how, you know, such initiative can really take the uh, economic and relationship between the two countries. As one example, um, we can see now the Lulu Group signing, uh, you know, this MOE with the government of Kashmir. Uh, similarly, you know, this such initiatives, uh, whether we are talking about the electronics, whether we are talking about gems and jewelries, I think one could think of signing of such MOUs and agreements between the private sector and the state, uh, whether it is Gujarat or it is Karnataka or Hyderabad. So these are a few things, uh, you know, we, we need to probably look at them. Uh, Professor Aparna is an expert on the, the how, what are the value chains and whether uh, India has to protect it. And I think India will have to look into it. Right. But when we talk about the strategic relationships, when we talk about, you know, uh, a comprehensive partnership, there would be some give and, give and take as well. How that has that will be balanced out, I think uh, it is for the economists and, you know, the industrialists to decide. Right. But no country would uh, probably agree on giving everything. So that, that I guess, is, uh, is probably going to be played out in in the other context. Uh, and basically uh, what we need to do is today, you know, whether we're talking about education, whether we're talking about culture, whether we're talking about other areas of cooperation, they become part and parcel of your uh, economic diplomacy as well. And right, I, right. I feel the, you know, setting up of educational institutions, particularly like IITs is something which will take our bilateral relationship to a, to a different level altogether. Right. And right. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank and maritime, you. I think we need not forget. I think that yes, is something of course. where uh, it, is, it is the strength of India. And there are many areas, uh, you know, when we're talking about innovation and science and technology, that's where the maritime cooperation, which is a demand, would become also a part of this larger, you know, uh, cooperation that and the engagement that we're talking about. I think I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Mr. Kumar, in two minutes, your final intervention. Um, very quickly, I'll bring up two aspects. One is that, you know, ironically or interestingly, uh, the UAE is also uh, looking for inward investments. Um, you know, in fact, recently, uh, just a couple of days back, they have announced uh, a target of uh, almost $450 billion, uh, a very stiff target. Uh, and I think the reason for that is uh, where, you know, they've got clearly articulated policies in terms of food security, farmer security, you know, uh, especially uh, there has been a significant worry about uh, supply chain uh, in, you know, disruptions that have taken place. And so all of these uh, have said, at least let's get some last mile production. Let's get, uh, you know, quite a bit of, uh, you know, strategic uh, reserves be built up in specific areas where you know, the UAE doesn't want to be left high and dry if there is uh, regional conflicts. So I think um, this is, you know, uh, particularly, uh, I think, useful for, uh, um, you know, the Indian manufacturing uh, segment, uh, because there is also therefore 100% foreign ownership that being permitted, you know, across in these, in these ventures. Uh, and, you know, and the infrastructure support and policy advocacy, you know, opportunities are significant again there. Uh, 
The second uh, uh, area where uh, you know, I would stress uh, is that uh, it's a highly competitive market in terms and, and their expectations in terms of quality and uh, scale, uh, whether for investments or even for uh, you know, uh, both inward and uh, outward investments um, is something that many segments of the Indian industry and trade would have to measure up to. Uh, and I think uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done you know, to create uh, that kind of enabling infrastructure, uh, both the trade and trade related infrastructure and in terms of investment related uh, issues, et cetera, sorting them out. So I would, I would emphasize these two aspects. So Ambassador Suri, in fact, we have heard about, you know, the opportunities and the costs and the challenges that are arising under various dimensions, economic, geoeconomic, geostrategic, political. So in two minutes, uh, your, your, your viewpoint. Right. Uh, so first I want to say something that Suresh mentioned about UAE's uh, inward investment efforts. Uh, we must pay attention to the way they have marketed their golden visa scheme and the way it has become a magnet for every high net worth individual from India to create a second home in Dubai and its implications for us has, doesn't have much to do with FTA, but it is something that we, wish, we should be very mindful of uh, that it is happening and, and, and perhaps worth looking into why it is uh, happening. Uh, the second area that we didn't discuss, and it was mentioned in passing by Professor Sahni, I think, was food security. Um, there was a very ambitious program for an India-UAE food corridor. Now, uh, it started when I was there. It uh, halted for a while, but I understand that it is going to pick up momentum. And one of the things that will give it momentum is the proposed UAE special economic zone somewhere on the west coast of India, where the facilities can be aggregated so that you have an efficient supply chain for uh, 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 everything from cereals to greens to fresh fruits to uh, 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 table food ready, uh, yeah, food to fork, farm to fork kind of thing. Uh, so a lot of work is going into that. And I hope that we will see because the level of ambition there is very large. And the Emiratis would themselves say, why should we be importing chickens from Brazil? Uh, when we've got India next door, as, just as a case in point. Uh, the third thing that we haven't really spoken much about is trade in services. What does the SIPA mean for our IT and IT enabled services? Uh, will we en end up getting a bigger chunk of the UAE IT uh, cake, which currently goes to the uh, American and European majors and not to the uh, uh, Indian ones? Uh, what does it mean for uh, tourism, for education services, uh, hospitality, and all of those? Uh, so I think there's work to be done in trying to understand. I can I know that there is a rough target of fifteen billion dollars that's been set, but from where to where, et cetera, I think needs a deeper study. And one final point is that you know I, even I've seen only the report that the text is eight hundred and eighty pages, uh, uh, and 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 it is awaiting ratification from the two sides before it is uh, released uh, uh, to the public, and, and so as always, we should be mindful of the devil in the detail. Right, right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. I I, I presume that uh, this is there are too many concerns that remain unanswered, of course, and that is not possible in a phase of uh, one hour, it seems, because uh, we were really. Uh, for awfully falling short of time every time a deliberation was coming up. We should have a second, you know, something like uh, a panel number two, something like that, like this, where we can flag off many of these issues because this is not merely a simple or a complicated process. It seems this is a, we are trying to address a very complex problem. FTA is a very, very complex problem. Complex problem in the sense it's not merely an economic cost benefit analysis. It is. It has intricate social implications. It has implicate geopolitical, geostrategic implications. And it also has what we often use in physics and statistics, the white noise, certain things which are not observed and certain things which might uh, emerge in fact as a shock to the entire system. So uh, 
Yeah, Ambassador Suri, would you like to say something? No, I just want to leave one thought with you for going yes. forward. You know, uh, uh, we have, with yourself in the center, we've got Professor Sahni and the formidable intellectual resources of uh, JNU. We've got the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade uh, in Delhi. Uh, in Dubai, you've got IBPC with its very diverse membership. You've also got the Indian Chartered Accountants Association, which is the largest chapter outside of India with over a thousand members. So there's a lot of expertise available and perhaps CNED can set up a little group uh, with these four organizations to delve deeper into uh, issues that are going to be increasingly important as we go forward. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that. And uh, that should essentially be the idea. Rather, what I find is that in cases of most of the FTAs that we have signed, this is based largely on a, uh, what they call often a CGE, so computable general equilibrium kind of an analysis looking at some of the economic costs and benefits, not really getting in fact deep down on what might be the other costs and benefits that might arise in the process. And uh, just as one of the questions that I raised for Professor Sony that was related to the value chain. What is the impact of the value chain? None of the FTAs have so far looked at it, whether whether it's in fact from an ex post or uh, all I mean is an ex ant or an ex post analysis that prior to having that FTA or after having that FTA. But this becomes extremely crucial as we are contending, in fact, with uh, the domestic constituencies who often have, you know, opposing interests at times. So uh, I presume that we are past the time as per uh, as. Uh, this event is concerned, so we have to close. Every good thing has to come to a close. And uh, so thanks to all the speakers, to all the panelists for fabulous interventions. And uh, uh, well, I presume that we should have another round of uh, this kind of a panel discussion where we can deliberate more. And, uh, and Ambassador Suri, your uh, suggestion is well taken. I presume that we should have this kind of a group which can convene with uh, certain sets of findings and can discuss and maybe we can present it across to the government at some point in time. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks all.